Come out this Tuesday and be on the vibe for our Halloween special. I'm joined by Dane Campbell of Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons. One of the things we used to do in the house was jam together. After, you know, once we got to a certain age, we had a drum kit in the garage, and then my dad and my older brother would jam with me, playing mm. all sorts of stuff. I think my dad would be playing bass, funnily enough, back then. A bit more old school, we like guitar solos. I know lots of bands now don't really do guitar solos. Mm. Imagine Strike the Match now, if, if you listen to that song, and it was just drum rolls all over it, drum fills all over the place. <laughs> it, it, just, it, just looks, it just ruined the song. It's about the, like, our music is about the vocals and the guitar. Like, like, we love Neil. Neil was great. You know, you, you won't mind me saying this. Some of the fans liked him, some of the fans didn't like him. One of the things we did want was a bit more of a gravelly vocal. It's very recognisable, which I think... Mm. If you think I think it, that's uh, the thing. Yeah, it's just recognisable. Ryan. Hello, how are you doing, man? Yeah, man, good. Good to see you. That looks like <laughs> a cool little setup you've got going there. Well, we have a little thing. I do have a party trick. I can go two different angles. Oh, my God. <laughs> You'll have to teach me how you do that. I have no idea. It's it's actually easier than what you think, you know. Um, I use a thing called a it's called a switcher. Right. So you plug in, um, like you you've got your cameras, and then there's like a little side port, like a mini uh, HDMI type thing, and then you plug in the other end into this like it's like a little desk type thing, and it just yeah. has buttons, and you can just alternate. So that's the thing want. that's connected to your computer. Yeah, so this here. <clears throat> is the the thing that's connected to the computer and then that connects to the cameras so it just talks but it's great because it's like an all-in-one device because it does audio as well so i just put everything through that and then here we are (laughs) is it like a time saver when it comes to editing then yeah i mean if you if you were to um live stream or do something like that you can uh you can just edit live while you're doing it Nice. Pretty much. So that's quite handy. Very good. Um, but yeah, the, that's, the, that's my little party trick. All the twitchers out there. <laughs> yeah, a lot a lot of people like that do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a handy little thing. Yeah. I appreciate your time. I know, obviously, that's you're right. quite busy these days. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm glad. I'm happy to, really happy to do this. And it's been... <laughs> I've been meaning to put myself out there a little bit more for podcasts. And yeah, yeah. I kind of did a few, you know, over the last few years, but I probably haven't done enough. So it's, it's great to be on yours. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So I'm here with uh, Dane Campbell of Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons. Thank you very much for joining me. Obviously, a, a very special episode, a Halloween special, hence the the random skull on the on the uh, the desk. <laughs> that's that's as far as I can go. But <laughs> I think. Um, you know that's pretty. That's further than I've gone. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even think about it, to be honest. I've got a calendar next to me with kittens on it. Um, yeah, very hardcore. Very, very hardcore. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm sitting in front of some Nintendo games, which are not very Halloween themed at all. Um, <laughs> and behind me is a load of crap that you can't see. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> baby um, clothes, old baby clothes. Yes, I mean it ends up dominating your life. I think. The whole baby yes. thing, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's, it's taken over mine. I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's just you know, it's just a you know, it's a big sacrifice, but it's worth it. Mm. Well, um, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't got up to that point. Yet. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Man. No, um, it's it's daunting. Yeah, until yeah. you do it, and then you re- you because I always thought, how do people do it? Yeah, and. and still have a life the answer is you don't really have a life but all all the moments you have bringing up a child it's just a, you can't really compare it to anything else like i've had pets and you've got a cat which i love i love my cat but it's just mm-hmm. it's not it's like that times 
a thousand in terms of how much time they take up just looking after them because they can't do anything. Well, it's my 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 son's at the moment six months old, hmm. so he literally can't do anything himself yet. So he just needs constant, apart from when he's sleeping, he yeah, constant interaction and everything, and yeah, but it's very fun. Well, later on, I imagine it's that that's where the cool stuff, like you can start and teach him something. Mm, yeah, maybe, got, maybe getting I've, behind the drum kit. <laughs> I've already done that. I can I sat yeah. him on my on my lap on my electric kit um, the other <laughs> the other day, and he loved it. To be honest, I was just playing. I was just playing while he was on my lap, yeah. and he was just like, he thought it was so cool. But then I kind of had the sticks in his hands, and I was obviously yeah. I played like a beat. And yeah, so I think I can definitely make a drummer out of him. Mm. And uh, he's had a bash on our piano as well. <laughs> you can't, I can't play piano myself. So it's just kind of him bashing and I'm just showing him different sounds. But yeah, he's, he seems interested in music so far. So let's hope he remains interested when he's a little bit older and doesn't mm. get into rugby and, and, yes. and things like, well, I don't mind football. Rugby, I don't want him to get into rugby. No offence to you, rugby players. In Wales... I was going to say, it's a big thing in Wales. It's a big thing in Wales, but... I don't want to offend anybody here, but (laughs) I'm just... I I grew up with a load of rugby boys, Mm. and I know what they get up to. And I don't really want him getting into those kind of crowds, to be honest. Normally, I ask... And uh, somebody, when they first come on, I normally ask kind of what was the thing that got them in to wanting to be a musician? But I imagine for you, I mean, obviously, you know, your father's like an accomplished musician at this point already. Was was this just something? I mean, I, I don't know whether when your parent is already somebody of a, a certain stature, whether you'd want to go in a totally different direction. Or was that, was it something that always felt natural for you? Yeah, um, I totally get what you mean about with some people, if their parents do one thing, they want to do mm. the opposite. I totally get that. But I think with us, we were obviously showing the instruments at a young age, um, not forced to play by any means. Mm. My my dad introduced us to you know guitar, keyboards, drums, and just the kind of the rock instruments. We, I guess... We showed that we were not only interested, but actually, you know, without you know, fairly able to play mm. at, at a young age, I guess, um, in a natural way. Whereas, I think some people have to try a bit harder. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not saying we're the best musicians in the world because we definitely aren't, but we picked it up naturally, um, without a hell of a lot of effort, really. But I think mm. starting that young does help. So, um, yeah, he never forced us to do anything. I think it was, you know, my, I, I'm the middle brother. Cause there's three brothers in the band. I'm the middle mm. age, the one in the middle age wise. So, my older brother Todd was already becoming quite quite a good guitar player. And I obviously, you look up to your your older siblings, and I mm. obviously thought that was cool, and one of the things we used to do in the house was jam together after, you know, once we got to a certain age. So we had a drum kit in the garage and then my dad and my older brother would jam with me playing Mm. all sorts of stuff. I think my dad would be playing bass funnily enough back then (laughs) for, with this, with this band. Mm. Um, Yeah. And we just carried on like that. And um, I guess when Tyler, who's the youngest brother got old enough, he kind of joined in with us. Uh, Todd started a band quite early. He started playing in a band. I think he was th- like 13, maybe. Mm-hmm. And he, he joined a band with older guys. I did something similar. When I got to that age, I joined a band with older guys because no one my age played. Um, mm. No one at my age was even interested in rock music, really. So it was kind of like, well, we had that was the only option to find the only other two rock mosha kids in the school basically who played <laughs> guitar and we started a band and yeah it, it, like uh, like looking back it was just a natural thing and mm. i 
I was never, I never thought, oh, my dad's a guitar player and a musician. I, I don't want to do that. I want to be a lawyer. Looking back, being a lawyer would probably be more beneficial with my <laughs> to my bank account. But I, you know, I didn't know what else I wanted to be. Hmm. You do these careers meetings in schools and stuff. And I was like, well, I don't really know what I want to be. But I, I enjoy playing music with people. They don't encourage you that that's an option in school yeah. they they don't discourage you from playing it but i remember when i decided to take it as like an a level and i remember one of my teachers i can't remember which one was like oh really that's not a proper subject that's a mickey mouse subject i was like it's bloody hard yeah <laughs> but it's like they didn't like consider it as a real career mm. path and it's quite funny because a few people from my school um especially from that area have done quite well in in rock bands and stuff whether it was short-lived maybe for some of them uh I know I'm lucky to still be doing it at my age but my professional life started quite later I was in slogging away in bands through all my teen well you know my late teens and 20s and it was only um I got to 29 I decided to drop all my other work that I was doing and make this professional. And that was only because the band had started kicking off with my dad, really. So I was at an advantage. I think if it wasn't for this band, realistically, I don't think I would be doing it professionally. Mm. I, I, I admit that. Maybe in, I might have had a lucky break and someone asked me to join a band. I, I don't know. But the band I was in, we did... I was in a band called Straight Lines. And we did download festival and sonosphere we toured a little bit mm. toured a little bit of europe but it wasn't at the stage where we were making money mm. it, it was just like oh we're we're on kerrang we were on the kerrang channel a few times and like that, that was a massive thing That'd be um, cool. and we were in the magazine a couple of times in rock sound magazine back in the day but that was it really we kind of struggled to get any real radio play like back then it was you had to be on radio one if you were a commercial rock band to really get an audience or get some support tour in arenas or something which we did, never did get mm. we, we we got some support tours playing clubs and uh, academies we were lucky enough to you know support different bands in like the o2 academies and stuff but it never really got any further than that mm. and it was a struggle it was hard work but it was a struggle and no one, none of us ever made any money. And we did that for, you know, three or four or five years. Mm. So it's, it's tough out there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Tough. Um, I think growing up, everybody has that, that band that's kind of their band. You know, they, it feels like that that's your first one that you really connect with. Did you have one in particular that stuck out for you? It was like, this is my band now. <laughs> Do you mean in terms of, what I used to listen to. Yeah. Oh uh, like, yeah. Uh, I think, um, I think everybody gravitates towards one in particular when they're kind of forming their taste. Yeah. Mine's a bit weird. The first one that always comes to mind. And I still would say it to this day is Weezer, which is strange okay. because the music I play isn't really yeah. like this, <laughs> but I kind of got I got into them fairly late on, I suppose. It was when their third album came out, the Green Album. Mm. And I was just like, wow, these, these are absolute banging tunes, really catchy. The music wasn't particularly complex, but I think that's why I liked it. And I mm. think I come from listening to, I grew up listening to more complex music. And I'm like my dad, like I've mentioned this on other people's interviews, like me and my brothers were watching like Steve Vai and Satriani videos when we were kids and stuff <laughs> and like in instrumental guitar music and like, and all my other friends were listening to the Spice Girls and, you know, yeah. just whatever commercial pop was. Um, and I, I, we kind of skipped that. We didn't do that. It was like, I, I didn't, not that I was discouraged from listening to it, but I wasn't exposed to it as much as your average family would have been back then. So uh, I discovered Weezer, the Green Album. I think it was, if I remember rightly, my dad brought home a load of CDs from, I want to say Interscope Records, 
I think he met someone who worked for Interscope, gave him a load of CDs of whatever bands had come out that that year. I might be wrong. It might not be Interscope. And I was like, oh, this one looks cool. It's a big green cover. I kind of heard the name, but I, I didn't really know much about him. Mm. And I just put it on. I was like, I love this. Let's check out their other stuff. And then I bought the the, the blue album and Pinkerton. And I was like, whoa, this is even cooler in a in a kind of darker way. But it's still really catchy. But the music is simple. The drumming was great. I like I like the drumming. And I think he's one of the most underrated rock drummers out there. Mm. Uh Pat. Um he's just got groove and swing. He plays for the song, which is what I always appreciate. But he he, he has something about him. I think he's in, you know, you can tell he's inspired by the Bonhams of the world and and stuff like that. But yeah, they're always the band that I always think they're my band. I know mm. m- most of my friends probably are not into them. Uh, a lot of people I know think they're crap or just <laughs> think they're stupid. They think they're like, a, they think they're one of these joke bands, but they're not really a joke band. They, they're not the most serious band <laughs> in the world. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But, you know, in terms of their output over the years, I think, I think they're, they're, they're the one I would say. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think I think there's a place in the catalog there for the for something a bit more stripped back, maybe something a bit more fun. Definitely, you know, as as you say, you don't want to. I mean, Steve Vai is great, but do you want to hear him every day? <laughs> Definitely not. And his new album's amazing, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But it's not the kind of thing. It doesn't suit every situation. Exactly. Putting on an instrumental guitar album <laughs> with different time signatures and progginess and stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, Weezer is just, it's just happy. Like most, I'd say 80% of the songs are just happy, catchy tunes. Mm. And you can normally figure out what the lyrics are about. Sometimes not, they're a bit weird. But um, yeah, overall, so for anyone out there listening, if you've never listened to a Weezer album, there you go. Go check it. Go, go check them out. Um, I would pick. Blue, which is the the original one, green. Um, my f- personal favorite mm. is called Maladroit, but most Weezer fans rate that as the worst album they've ever released. Interesting, but it's my favorite album. So, so you're going proper niche. You're not not just yeah. going for Weezer, which nobody would probably expect. But you're also going for the album that nobody likes either. <laughs> yeah, the album. No, no, no Weezer fans like this album, but it's my favorite album that they've ever done. Ah. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll have to go and check it out. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons formed back in uh, 2016. Um, it's unusual to have that kind of that nearly full band of of uh, brothers and a father. So, how did that conversation kind of first come about? I know you were speaking there that you used to jam together, but becoming like a a full on band is kind of a different thing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um... We, me and Todd had been in that band Straight Lines together. Mm. So we'd, we, we'd already played in bands. I was in another band called Squad with him back in my earlier days and his earlier days. Uh, Tyler, we never really played in a band together. He was in a band called The People of the Poet at the time. And they're still, they're still going. They're a good band, really good band. Mm. Um, and it was coming up to Todd's 30th birthday, I believe. And we'd hired out a venue in Cardiff to have a bit of a party and, you know, invited our friends and family. Uh, we hired a band, which is a friend of mine, like a cover band, but we just said, Oh, wouldn't it be fun if we just went up and jammed something during the interval, if the band let us just for a bit of a laugh, because mm. do some covers. So we spoke to our friend, Neil, Neil Starr, who was, you know, our original singer. Yeah. And we were friends with him. And Todd was in a band with him back in the day called Dopamine. So there's lots of links here. Um, so we said, oh, you know, you come into Todd's birthday. Do you fancy singing some songs with us? And we never played with him. I'd never played with Neil, despite being mm. a big fan of his work over the years. And essentially, yeah, we did a few covers. Um, we did We did rehearse once. We had a quick rehearsal like the couple of days before just to see how it went. And basically we went down a storm and like so many people were like, Oh, you know, motorhead are a little bit quieter these days because mm. it was, it was while, while Lemmy was still alive. 
but they had you know reduced the the, the amount of gigs they were playing a little bit mm. um you know why don't we why don't we do this as a side project you know my you know my dad had time to do it um for us it was like well yeah we might be able to make something of this we might be actually finally be able to earn a few quid from <laughs> playing in a band <laughs> because we had our, you know my dad's name attached to it which jump started the career that that a normal new band would have and i we all admit that we always admit that we yeah. kind of had a, we had a bit of a head start um but that's that was how it started and i think we played our first ever show uh it was it was called bogies in cardiff it was a famous uh metal club in cardiff it's not there anymore sadly but that was mm. our first ever like paid show and then we played bloodstock festival which again how many bands would say this second ever show was bloodstock exactly. it was the small smaller stage of bloodstock but it was pretty cool and then it just kind of you know fans of motorhead and and, and us just discovered the band and we're like, oh, that'd be cool. I'd love to go and see Phil play a small venue. Um, and yeah, we're still doing it. But now we're playing our own stuff. Mm. What's that feeling like for you personally? I mean, going out to, I know obviously it's a smaller stage there, but if that's your second gig going to a Bloodstock crowd, I mean, that must be, I mean, obviously Phil's been there and done that. But for you guys, that must be something like, oh, something's kind of, this is getting serious quite quick. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, all of us had been in previous bands and we had mm. played big festivals and so it wasn't like we'd never played to an audience before. Yeah. But we were normally in that kind of support slot role or, you know, a low slot on a festival. So similar to this. Um mm. but yeah, it was it was cool to get some recognition straight off instead of slogging away for years going on at 7 p.m opening up for other bands for you know if you're lucky 50 quid petrol money which i don't even know if bands get that these days to opening bands get 50 mm. quid it was always 50 quid for me back in the day if you were the opening band and that's if you that's if the promoter actually stayed around and didn't do a runner <laughs> you'd actually get your 50 quid at the end of the night and then three of you had driven so you split that you can't even split it because it's a weird amount. Um, and you probably paid more than that in petrol anyway. <laughs> this is it. <a> <laughs> and petrol prices have gone up now. So I hope they get more than 50 quid if they do. But I doubt that. I bet that's still the norm. I know, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so jumping forward to where we are today, obviously, uh, your latest album, uh, Kings of the Asylum. Uh, it's your third studio album, and of course, the the first to feature Joel on vocals. First off, how did you guys kind of decide on Joel to be your new frontman? I mean, I feel you know replacing a vocalist is always something I find that that, that must be quite difficult to do because, of course, you know it's the voice of the band. Yeah, uh, let's say it wasn't easy at all. Um, mm. The like Neil, like we love Neil. Neil was great. Yeah. Uh, you know, you he, he won't mind me saying this. Some of the fans liked him, some of the fans didn't like him mm. in terms of the style of his voice. But I think that comes down to there's a small percentage of our fans that just expect us and want us to be motorhead, but we're not. Yeah, yeah. And and to be honest with you know, a lot of people would say that was that was the reason because he didn't sound like Lemmy. Mm. Um but finding someone else that we didn't want someone to sound like Lemmy because that was never the intention with the band. What's the point? There's lots of tribute bands already out there. Good tribute bands that do that. Uh, but we did want someone different. We did. One of the things we did want was a bit more of a gravelly vocal. If we could find someone, which Joel has, um, you know, not the looks or everything, but he kind of looked, he automatically looks like he's part of the band without trying you know he's got the, the beard and the long hair and tattoos and stuff um neil had long hair as well but <laughs> I'm, I'm not you know i'm not comparing him in terms of no, looks no. or anything but he just looked at the part instantly mm. and he had the experience of touring um he's actually a lot of people don't know this but 
Joel's got a big background of um, working as a crew mm. on the crew for bands, bigger bands, playing bigger shows than what we play in festivals and stuff. So he kind of knew how all that side of things worked, which was cool compared to bringing in someone that hadn't been on big stages before and like and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, we asked for people to send in audition tapes of them mm. singing our songs. We had loads of emails, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a hundred, which is quite a lot to, to get through. Some people, unfortunately, I don't know. It was, you know, it was never a realistic thing. No offense. <laughs> uh, like, I don't know why some people bothered. Maybe they, <laughs> you know, you never, tr- I guess you don't try, you never know. But, you know, it came down to, you know, we shortlisted it about five people. Joel was one of them. Mm. Uh he he went a bit further then and recorded himself singing along to our, our songs. Uh, you know, he went out of his way and got rid of the vocal tracks and stuff like that. No, no, I think we made some instrumental versions of our songs. That was it. Mm-hmm. And then we sent those to the shortlisted people. Uh, Joel came back and smashed some versions of our songs. And we were like, oh, I think he sounds like the man. Let's invite him down for a jam. And yeah, it went well, and we got on with him personally. He seemed like a pretty cool, chilled. He's very chilled out yeah. guy, despite his his on stage persona. <laughs> um, I'd say he was like fa- you know fairly introverted, like the rest of us are. To be honest, mm. we're all pretty pretty quiet, apart from Tyler when he's had a few beers. He's like one of the loudest men in the in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, we're all pretty chilled out. We don't, you know and. You know he's not you know he's not a, into drinking or drugs or anything mm. like that because you know we're not about that despite what some people might think you know a few of us like a beer every now and again but you know that's it mm. we, we don't, we're not into anything else uh, i know that's not very rock and roll but that's how we i guess that's how we've stayed a band for as long as we have and played so many shows because we're all pretty stable in that department. <laughs> um, I think that's how it is nowadays, you know. I, th- yeah. I think a lot of people assume, oh, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, but it's kind of, it's different now, isn't it? It's not really, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think some people, they they think, oh, what's going to be in the dressing room? And like people are having a cup of tea, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's not quite. <laughs> yeah, there's never been any sex or drugs in our dressing room. <laughs> no. I, t- I tell you that for anyone disappointed. Um there's probably barely ever been a female in our dressing room. Yeah. My wife's going to do a few gigs and, that's, and my mum. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. And um, there's lots of bananas and yeah. fruit in there. And uh, there's some non, non-alcoholic non beer, uh, some real beer too. So, don't, you know, we're not completely oh. lame. It's not completely lame. <laughs> lots of soft drinks, um, pot noodles, uh, but no, no cocaine, sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I felt that, you know, I mean, having seen you guys live and now, now heard the record, I feel that Joel is just a real great fit. I mean, that's why I wanted to kind of put that question to you because, you know, he feels like he's kind of been in the band for a long time. You know, it feels like he's been there for years, but obviously like this is his first record. I mean, did you look at when you went into the studio, did you look at approaching this album differently now? Obviously, you've got this new dynamic in the band. To be honest with you, we did something fairly similar to what we'd done with the previous album. Mm. And with the previous album, we'd written and recorded at least demos for all the songs without even Neil, our singer at the time, getting involved. Mm. And that was how we did things. We'd, we'd present him with a demo of instrumental stuff, and then he'd go away and write his his vocals and his lyrics over the top uh and then we came into the studio and did it all for real and we did something similar with this the reason we'd done it with the previous album was mainly because of well no i i don't want to blame covid because we'd written most of the songs before the pandemic had started but it was just the way the way we we did things like neil was always quite busy with other projects and he managed managed a few bands at the time and and stuff like that and he had you know he had a couple of kids so he was busy busy man he had a business he does merch printing lots of things mm-hmm. so like it just worked for us all for just us to do the music 
and then present him. And we we had all our faith that he'd be able to come up with the goods, and he always did. He was a very good songwriter, uh, very good at hooks and writing ca- catchy choruses and stuff like that. So he was great. Uh, with with Joel, it was more kind of hoping he would do the same. Um, he wasn't involved in any of the 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 music side of things. Mm. Um, he could have been if he wanted, I think. But it was again, he he lived a little bit further away, like he lives like north of Bristol, really in South Wales. So it is a bit more of a trek for him to come to the the studio every day where we rehearse and stuff like that. But we. We were sending him, we'd send him drums, guitar, and bass. We we wrote this, we wrote the idea for the song, put it down the following day, right? We literally jammed together, the rest of us. Oh, that's cool. Came back the next day, put the drums down for that song or those two songs or those three songs. The next day, Tyler was in doing his bass. The next day, guitars. And then we'd send those kind of rough mixes to Joel to to come up with his own uh you know vocals and lyrics he'd send us some demos back you know a few weeks later what do you think of these guys and we were like i remember the first one he sent back was the song the hunt we didn't have a Ooh. title for it back then but it was probably the heaviest song on the album and we were like whoa this is awesome so this <laughs> is going to go really well uh it took a while because we started gigging shortly after we had a really busy festival season mm. so it did take a while until we got more vocals laid down so it did it was a you know it wasn't a quick process the music was really quick the, the coming up with the music was ridiculously quick we did it all in like a month and that, that's writing and recording which like i don't love that way for being a drummer i i would love to have known what the vocals were doing on those tracks before mm. recording my final parts because as as a, a drummer and a part writer and a part songwriter, it's a disadvantage not knowing where the vocals are going to be because I can play off what the lyrics are or what the what the the hooks are going to be. I can put a little stab there, you know, in in time with something vocally, but I didn't have any vocals to go off. So mm. if it's frustrating to me a little bit how we do things because I feel I'm only doing eighty percent of what I could do as a drum part writer mm. without the vocals being there. Maybe if you're a drummer listening to this, you know what I mean. A lot of bands will write all together with the singer present, coming up with melodies and hooks mm. as you come up with the music. And then you hear something in the vocals. And you're like, oh, that's cool. What if I do this or, you know, hit a hit a China symbol there or, you know, something the links in with the vocals, but there's nothing really like that on the album. And when I listened to Joel's vocals later on, I came up with a few little ideas. Oh, I, I could have done could've that done there. That. I could have done that there. <laughs> or, or, uh, but in, in alternative to that, he'd been able to do things around my drumming and do things mm-hmm. around the guitar playing to some extent. But so I think like, it's not really my decision, but if we did the next album, I'd love to do it all together. But I, I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll see. We'll see. Yes, you never know. Might change. Yeah. Um, the the two real kind of standout tracks for me personally are uh, Schizophrenia and uh, Strike the Match. Could you talk a bit about those two songs? I mean, obviously you spoke a bit about you know that kind of process, but. You know, for for me, they they are. I mean, obviously, they're like two two of the singles in there. Uh, yeah. You know, it's quite riff centric. How how did they, that kind of come about? Um, I'm trying to think of the order in which we'd come up with those. I think "Strike the Match" was one of the ones we recorded first musically, mm. but it was one of the last ones Joel did the vocals for. I think I might be wrong. I think that's how we worked out. And we weren't thinking, oh, this is going to be a single, this is going to be a single, mm. until Joel had done his thing, really, because certain songs, like I would, Schizophrenia, I wouldn't have picked that as a single, but at, when I when we were just recording the music, it wasn't, oh, this is obviously going to be a single, because it's, mm. like you said, riff-based, but it's, I don't know, it's what, what, what he brought to the brought to the song after we were like oh that's a really good hook in the chorus 
um the the lyrics suited the the theme of the album quite well uh, I, I had nothing to do with the lyrics so i can't really talk about that you'd have to interview Joel again yeah. <laughs> to talk about the actual <laughs> lyrics but yeah obviously with the theme of the album was the, with the, the asylum and the kind of mm. the mental mental health disorders and stuff like that i guess that gave him give him a topic to to sing about and write about um yeah uh they were very different songs um mm. Str- strike the match we were thinking obviously more just hard rock simple uh i was thinking acdc with regards to dr- my drumming was like mm. well you know they be one of my favorite rock bands ever most other people's favorite rock bands phil rudd is one of my idols when it comes to drumming i've actually got a drum head signed by him there oh. i've never met him unfortunately but a friend of mine got him to sign a drum head for me um but yeah it, it, at the end of the day they're one of the most successful bands of all time probably you know the most the maybe no. they're definitely top five aren't they mm. and and he's never done any flash anything flash with the drum in and they've got some of the most played songs on earth mm-hmm. so it just like it just in terms of my drum in that's why you know i do the whole drum for the song podcast yeah. thing i'm not a flashy drummer and in the style of music that i play i don't feel like it requires that there's a little flurry here and there just for decoration but like it's not the band i'm in it's not about the drums I don't mm. think it's it's got my dad's name on it. He plays the guitar. It's it's a bit more old school. We like guitar solos. I know lots of bands now don't really do guitar solos, mm. or they just do melodic ones that are just the melody of the chorus, which is fine. Like we we used to do a lot of those, and it's it's great. But we're we're a very guitar focused band. So the last thing, in my opinion, again, it's all mm. subjective. Is is if if uh, imagine strike the match now, if if you listen to that song and it was just drum rolls all over it, drum fills all over the place, yeah. it, it's just it just like it just ruined the song. It's about the like our music is about the vocals and the guitar, mm. and, and that's it. I'm just there to 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 create energy, uh, and 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 fill a certain sonic area um and the texture and 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 hopefully help the songs groove um i guess this is with like our genre this is not the most groovy music like i try and do it as best as i can but i'd love to play in say a more funk influenced rock band or something i think i would enjoy that more in terms of being me being allowed to not allowed uh being able to express space. yeah more yeah. space to be able to groove there's no space um in terms of the texture mm. of our music is very full on it's all pretty if you looked at the sound wave it's probably just <laughs> that's pretty much <laughs> how our music is but that's what i'd say most of our listeners enjoy they just like the, the loud energetic rock um, but yeah, I, we've, I've gone on off on a tangent. But yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people's favorite songs are those. Like "Strike the Match" was never my favorite. I'll, I don't mind saying this, yeah, yeah. and it still isn't. I like. I agreed to it being a, a single, it, mm. like, and I get why. But it was never my favorite choice as, as a single. I um I think maybe because it doesn't. I don't know. I think because it doesn't really have our identity on it as much as schizophrenia. It sounds a bit too much it like is, other it, bands than than schizophrenia does, which I think sounds like us. I think I think it certainly has a different flavor. Yeah. Um which I I've personally found it that that was interesting to see maybe a different side of the coin of the mm. band you know it's something a little bit different that we haven't quite heard from you guys yet yeah and you know i think i think in terms of maybe just to have that contrast because you have schizophrenia as that other single just to yeah. have kind of 
uh, uh, something a bit different. But that, that's my view. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it, the idea obviously was to have something a bit more mm. middle, middle of the road to, to try and get on the ra- on the rock radio stations. Um, mm. And it, yeah, it, you know, that's, that song is perfect for that, for like, you know, your planet rock radio mm. station and stuff like that. And, and to attract new people to the band, because we're still at mm. this stage where like, like I'd say we work hard. We play a lot. We yeah. do lots of festivals. We, you know, we've had a few good support tours, uh, not so many in the UK, but we've done a few. But it's it's not easy to sell tickets and to sell records. We still need a lot more people to discover us and to actually listen to our music and go, ah, I really mm. like that. Um, we do have, you know, a small portion of the Motorhead audience, but not we haven't got all of it. There's a lot of people that are not interested, mm. there's, or there's a lot of people that a lot of Motorhead fans probably don't know we exist yet because they they're not into yeah. social media and they're not into Planet Rock and. They just listen to their their CDs and their vinyl collection, and they you know they don't know we exist yet. So we're still you know I'm not saying struggling, but we want to get to a bigger level than we are. Yeah, we're cool. still playing clubs, we're still headlining clubs. We want to be headlining bigger places, ideally. But mm. it's it's not as easy as some people might think it is. But some bands go they shoot up, they go from playing support slots in bars. Mm. to headline in academy venues in in a short space of time and well done to those bands is is something that we we're not doing that they're doing uh where, or whether it's just the music is more um appealing to the masses i don't know but uh, we want to try and get a bit of that without we don't want to detract too far away from mm. you know what we we originally wanted to do is just to write music that we like and that we think our current fans will enjoy. We're not really ever going to, we're not going to go out there and write a pop album or an album full of ballads or you know, that's never going to happen with us because that's not what we are. Um, we're not going to ever do a sellout album. If that's what mm. I mean. That's what no, I mean. We're I not. It, yeah. And I think if we did, you know, I think people, <laughs> people would get a bit annoyed. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, I feel with the whole kind of moving up to another tier, I, I think some of it is just a simple thing of like a right place at the right time. You know, right? you, you, I hear this from like loads of different bands where it's like, you know, what, what was kind of this moment for you where you went from, you know, the clubs to the, to the big kind of venues or whatever. And it seems there's so much of it that's just by chance. Um, and you know, not, not everybody can kind of explain how, you know, they're, they're like, well, we just kind of fell into the, to this thing and then this happened and then this guy just happened to turn up. And it's like, it's 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 often by chance. And I, I mean, I feel that it is coming for you guys. I mean, I, I certainly feel that, you know, um, this latest album is is a step up in my, my personal opinion. I think, you know, it's, um, I think... <laughs> You know, I, 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 I think Joel is a great fit. And I feel that, you know, he, he really complements the rest of you guys. I, I don't know whether he's that, that, that kind of missing piece of the puzzle. That's what we're, we are hoping in the, mm. you know, in the long term. And I'm sure he doesn't mind us saying that. He has added a lot yeah. to our live shows as well. I don't know if you've yeah. seen us live since he's been in the band, but yeah, he's, yeah. he's quite more, he's quite a dominating presence. Um, you know, it, with as far as possible, he likes to swear, which some people don't <laughs> like. Apparently, we've had a few people commenting about really his swearing. It's like, well, we called Phil Campbell and the bastard sons. It's <laughs> like, what, what do you, like, what do you expect to, if you come and watch us? There's going to be a bit of swearing involved, <laughs> yeah. and you know, and 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 stuff like that. But yeah, the album, I think, yeah, the general consensus is, yeah, it's better than the other albums. It's the mm. next step up, but we need to translate that into like ticket sales now for our upcoming tour. We've got a UK tour coming up, headline mm. tour. Playing some cities we've played before, some we've not played so much. I don't think anything's sold out yet. And, so, you know, some bands sell out tours pretty quickly. So it's like, it's strange. It's not that easy. Um, mm. And I, I don't know what, what the magic thing is that we need to do to to sell out more gigs. I am, I'm sure most of them will be really busy on the, de- on the night. Maybe mm. it's the, a- the average age range of our audience is maybe a little bit older than some of these younger bands. 
and the old school way is, oh, I'll, I'll turn up and buy a ticket on the door or, or I don't know yes. how to use PayPal is a thing. And, yeah, and, yeah. and it, it is a thing. Or oh, I don't have a PayPal account or, or I, I don't want to put my credit card details on the internet. Like I've yes, spoke to still, people who don't yeah. like, I don't like, you know, they don't do that. And <laughs> fair enough. Cause there's a lot of scammers out there and hackers. I, I get it. Um, but yeah, like it'd be, it'd be lovely now. Like we've just released the album a few mm. months in advance of the tour. It'd be lovely to have some sold out shows because that makes us look good. And it, it, it creates more urgency for other people to buy tickets mm. if they want to come. Um, so if you are watching this uh, and you're thinking about coming to see us, buy a ticket in advance because it helps the promoters as well. It helps us. It helps the promoters have more confidence and and it means they'll have, you know, it it just helps everyone. Just do it. Because I know bands that have done not enough tickets in advance and then they, they cancel the tour and then you get hundreds of people. Oh, I was hoping to go. Yeah, did, you buy a, did you buy a ticket? Oh, no, I was hoping to buy one closer to the date. Well, if everyone had that, had that way of thinking, all tours would be canceled because mm. you need to sell some tickets in advance. <laughs> Otherwise it's, there's too much risk for everyone involved. Mm. Um, no, I agree. Um, I mean, the link will be in the uh, description for the for the new tour. Thank you. Um, of course, you know you have uh, your own podcast yourself, uh, Drum for the Song podcast, which we kind of briefly touched on there, um, where you sit down and speak with uh, various drummers from the scene. I feel that you know often, uh, you know, in an in an interview or a podcast. That you know, like people naturally would gravitate towards, you know, a guitarist or a vocalist. Was was that kind of a? Uh, I mean, I, th- I think a drummer can be a bit overlooked, you know, in terms of an interview or something like that. Was that kind of part of your reason for wanting to go in for drummers? I mean, obviously, and we know that you're a drummer yourself, but did you want to kind of shed a bit of light on what you guys do? I, I guess so. Um, when I started. I did like I was a I listened to lots of podcasts. I didn't listen to that many music ones, but yeah, most mm. of the music ones were either with front people, front person, yeah. or the you know, maybe the lead guitarist or whatever. Very rarely would it be an interview with a drummer. And I was obviously like, well, yeah, we do need a bit of light shed on us and mm. a bit of bit of glory. And there's obviously a massive community of drummers out there that listen to podcasts too. Mm. There are lots of drum podcasts. I'm not the only one there's there's a lot a lot of which i've discovered since i started mine and it's been very difficult to really um you know what it's like it's a hard slog isn't it there's a lot of work it involved is. yeah um <laughs> it's a it's you gradually you very gradually build more listeners hopefully every month sometimes mm. it dips it drops off sometimes mm-hmm. you have little peaks here and there and spikes it's it's very difficult but i thought i'll stick to the drummer thing because that's what i know fair amount about and that's what i'd be comfortable talking about rather than just release another generic mm. music podcast or you know musician podcast because there's enough of those already um but that was the idea um like i have taken a bit of a break from it since my child was born um mm. i did release an episode this month so I'm, I'm trying to get back on the wagon but i must say it's been difficult to find the time to do everything that's necessary, even with just promotion, mm. uh, promoting the episodes and interacting with everyone. It takes time and all the social media stuff. So I kind of needed that break, um, but it's still available. It's still up there. That's the way I thought it was like, I, I don't have to release any content. Hopefully the odd person might still stumble across an episode here or there or people that had recently discovered the podcast have got time to catch up now on the other episodes. Mm. Um, so I've, I've done 51 episodes to date, which isn't a crazy amount. I know you've, you've probably far, have you, what, what yeah. number is this going to be roughly? So, oh God, I keep losing track of my number. I think I'm somewhere. I think this is 98, oh, wow. 97. Oh, nice. I'm closing in on a hundred. That'd be a really, that'd be a really cool thing to get to 100 man so i think get someone special in for that one i know it's 
it, it, it feels yeah it's getting to that point where it's like oh i feel like we've got to get somebody like <laughs> yeah <for 100. laughs> that's where that's where i felt when i i knew 50 was approaching i was yeah. like and i knew i knew i had a, obviously i had a kid coming along i was like mm, maybe i can have a little break after 50 but i would love 50 to be someone really cool and i i did manage to arrange that um and it was my most popular episode to date but it's just because of who the guest was it blew and it's up. Not, yeah it blew Say up just for, for one one episode <laughs> and then and then yeah people are still discovering it and i i noticed a few people start following me in their you know slipknot fans sorry it was chris fain who was used oh. to be the percussionist of slipknot and um and he had it was his first ever interview apparently and oh. it'd been on the cards for over a year uh, my dad's good friends with him and we exchanged numbers and emails ages ago. And then I guess he just went a bit quiet and I thought, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop chasing him now because he's obviously not that interested. And then I f- discovered then he had a new number and I'm like, Oh, I've uh, been texting his old number. <laughs> my dad gave him his, gave me his new number and he replied straight away. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. Great next week i was like yes <laughs> perfect <laughs> but it, you know i i got to the stage of being you obviously know what is exactly what it's like chasing potential guests or yeah and you don't want to become one of these guys that hassles people but you want to remind them oh yeah you said you do this or and then you just stop getting replies and i kind of got a bit fed up of People agreeing to do it, and then when it came to arranging it, I just it just wasn't have, ever happening, and I just got a bit fed up, and I was like, ah, oh. the band was getting busy again, mm. and I was like, let me just take a break. <laughs> <laughs> but like fifth place, you for you know you, you keep you keep you doing it, and um, and you obviously got it nailed with the the sound quality and the the way you're asking me questions. I think is perfect and. We're oh, not. Thank you. <laughs> we're not really talking over each other, which is no. something I I know I'm guilty of. And for people listening, we're using Zoom. There is a very slight delay, and sometimes that that's why it appears that we're talking over each other, because I will, for example, start saying something. Ryan doesn't quite hear it till a split second after Ryan starts saying something, and then we're just going. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's. It, it's it was a difficult thing. I mean, at, at the beginning, I ended up doing like a heavy amount of editing because, like, if if anybody goes back and hears those early episodes, <laughs> it's, it's certainly that point where it's like you're you're coming in and you're talking over each other, and it's like you're both kind of waiting for this moment, but you can tell, as you say, there is a delay, so you're both waiting, and then you're going again, and it's like I don't know. I mean, I've I've always tried to kind of. You know, I I don't really like the term interview because I think that kind of makes people go, "Ooh, this feels really formal. It feels really serious." Like, I, um, I, agree. I always, yeah, I always looked at, you know, um, like if I was going to speak to you in a bar or if I was going to talk to you like a, a normal person, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I found the whole concept of like, maybe, maybe that was more kind of a radio interview thing, but like the whole, like it's very in and out. It's very tight, isn't it? And it's like bish, bash, bosh, new album. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. I think there's much more. Well, yeah, but podcasts are more conversational mm. and they're not limited to, this is the question. What's your answer? This is the yeah. next question. Like, yeah, you might write notes or have a rough guide of how you want yeah. the conversation to go. But uh, like, I think I always use the word conversation when I describe uh, my podcast. Like if, if someone searches it on Apple, it'll say conversations with pro drummers. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I sometimes use the word interview on YouTube, but that's more of a, it's good to get found that way, though. Yeah, I I don't want to use the word clickbait because I'm not a clickbaiter, <laughs> but it's more more likely someone goes, oh, I, I'm a fan of that person. Mm. I didn't know they did a, an interview. Let's go check it out. And no mm. one ever does anyway because YouTube is very difficult. It's, it's a bizarre thing. I mean, I've got fortunate. It's the the robots, as I call them, the algorithm. Yes. It either hates you. 
or all of a sudden it just goes actually i quite like this one so i'm just going to recommend that yeah <laughs> no reason why <laughs> well it, it never happened it never happened for me until the chris fane episode yeah and that and that i it's it's a lot to do from what i understand if you get a lot of initial views immediately after the mm. upload then it goes all oh, right this must be onto something i'll show this to more people and then it kind of just builds and builds but w- with an average episode of mine especially if the the, the guest doesn't share it mm. or if they share it a week later it's kind of missed the boat a little bit um you know most of mine just they're just there I, and they go to my audience and that's it um and that's it and i just gotta I just put up with that's the way it works with me, no matter what I do. And no matter where I post it on on social media, it just gets swallowed up and thrown out to the sidelines. Sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes you can, I mean, I've found this where you promote something and you put out the video and you do this. And then somebody goes, like a year later, they go, oh, I've only just found this. I never, never really, <laughs> and I'm like, where have you been <laughs> for yeah. the last year? <laughs> It's crazy, and it's like, oh, I didn't know you had a podcast. It's like, oh, I've yeah, just been doing it for two years, talking <laughs> yeah. about it every week on my social media. <laughs> yeah. But uh, obviously, you don't see, you obviously don't see those posts because no. it doesn't think you're, it doesn't think that you're that way inclined that you're interested in that, or they just, they you heard of the term shadow banning? Yes, I have heard of it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm constantly shadow banned <laughs> with with anything regarding music. Or now, which I don't know if you know about, I'm an I'm an estate agent as well. Yeah, yeah. And whenever I post stuff about property, doesn't like it. Nah, it doesn't like that because it it knows. Oh, this is something salesy going on here. Yeah, yeah. And and it's <laughs> and it, it always linking you to some external site or whatever. It doesn't like that. Um, mm. but yeah, it's it's difficult. <laughs> It is, but we will get there eventually. <laughs> Let's hope so. But you're doing really well, so congratulations and thanks. I'm, I'm for, okay. For I'm, not, I'm not on fire. <laughs> but, yeah. No, well, like I said, I, I, I was, I was familiar with the show before you asked me to come on, which and, is cool. Yeah. Well, definitely. It's always a triumph. Anybody yeah. that knows who who I am yeah. or what the show is, it's always cool. Yeah. Um, a question I was like to to finish on. I ask every guest. Um, it's a bit of a hypothetical one. Uh, if you could tour with one band from the past and one band from the present, who would they be? Ah, oh, that's really cool. Um, like, so you could pick a certain era of a band. Yeah, in terms of could, if Phil Campbell yeah. and the Bastard Sons would tour with them, or just me in general. Um, I mean, you could be entirely selfish. You could say. Uh, Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons, we are touring with such and such. Mm. You have control. Like this can be your your okay. gig or your tour. Yeah. I guess if it was just me in terms of who would I enjoy supporting mm. every night and I think we would benefit the most from, it wouldn't necessarily be a Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons, but it'd be whatever rock band I was in. Yeah, would would be Foo Fighters, to be honest. Mm. I think I think like that's always the the dream is to like support Foo Fighters on a stadium tour or something like that around America. Yeah. That would be like that would be the dream. <laughs> um, I don't know if it would be amazing for Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons to do it. It might not be terrible, but we're probably not the perfect support band for their audience. So just putting that out there. Um, so they're still going. A band from the past. Um, oh, most bands I listen to are still going. Um, hmm. I mean, some are always tempted to go for like a, a prime era Led Zeppelin or. A, well, I, I get. Uh, I not saying that. I'd have to say it'd be Black Sabbath because they're not officially mm. going now, are they kind of? Ish? No, they've they've kind of called it a day. I mean, I imagine there'll be some other reunion of a reunion, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think... they're not currently yeah. active, are they? No. I don't think so. Um, I'd say that, like, Phil Campbell and the Sab- Bastard Sons supporting Black Sabbath, now that mm. would be, that would be like the perfect audience for us, I think, in my opinion. 
and mm. I would love it because I'm a big fan. And yeah, it'd just be like, you know, like I don't know. If is I'd there be a dying. favorite? Is there a favorite Sabbath era? I mean, obviously, a lot of people are they're either an Aussie guy or a Dio guy. I mean, there's I'm I love the 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 first self titled album. When mm. I discovered that, which is like way later in life, I, I'd always known who Black Sabbath were, obviously, but it was mm. only, I think I was like mid twenties. I started buying all their albums. Wow, late I don't have day. all of them. I don't have all of them, but I, mm. you know, I started, I started with that and worked my way up. And that, I think if being from a drummer's perspective, it's so jazzy. The drumming is so jazzy and open and free. And I'm like, whoa, this is like, how have I not? been exposed to this before and i i just that's what made me love it and just the the production of it there's a lot more space than i imagined uh, i guess it was more to do with how music was produced back then there mm. wasn't this wall of sound thing that everyone does now and all the compression and stuff which is what we we do now <laughs> um but yeah that but in terms of vocalist tio was way better vocalist than ozzy mm in my opinion. Um, and yeah, you know, he, he, he probably didn't have, he's got pockets of amazingness mm. of, it, of the songs he did with Sabbath. But I think overall, obviously Ozzy has probably more hits or great songs that he was a part of, uh, but he can barely stand up now. But, you know, I'm not sure how, much I would look forward to watching them these days if they were to do a tour. And I'm not sure if it's all bloody auto tuned anyway, <laughs> to be honest, from what I, from, from what I've heard. Yeah. There's a lot <laughs> of uh, bands that do live auto tuning nowadays. Um, you know, mm. I, I'm not sure how I feel about stuff like that. I'm like, uh, I don't know if it's, it's between <laughs> them not touring at all. Or touring and sounding like garbage, mm. or touring with auto tune and fans being able to see the band. I guess there's an argument for that, but I, I like going to see live music, and to me, that's not live. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. No, I agree. It's, it's it's weird. I know it's it's a lot of people, and the other argument that people talk about these days, which is very topical, is the back in track thing. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah, I'm I'm very, I'm very in the camp of. I would never want to do it with any of my bands. Mm. Um, I understand why certain bands use it for certain things, like added accompaniment and or orchestration that you know can't really be pulled off live properly. I'm not into it when bands have backing vocals and guitar tracks and uh, uh, and stuff like that on a on a backing track. I'm like, that's that's not cool. Like, because like just I'd rather hear the back like the other musicians singing the harmony sl slightly out of tune or yeah and it'd be real and it'd be on track and the mime in I'm like that's not that's not what I paid to see mate <laughs> but there that that's I don't know there's that's a topical thing right now and it has been for years but like I I understand why some bands do it but when bands take it too far I'm like nah just just either either quit and and don't tour or just i don't know just no, start a boy, I, boy band or something no i i agree i think <laughs> i mean there's a a common thing that i often say on here is you know i i think the key now is like the uh the imperfections you know i don't want it to be perfect yeah. Whereas I think you you see quite a lot now with that modern technology available, they're striving for nigh on perfection, and it becomes almost robotic. Mm. And, it, and it kind of it's it's a bit weird. Like if you hear, I imagine. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate to where I've been to quite a lot of shows where you don't hear like a backing track. Um, but I would imagine being there and then hearing sounds that don't tally with what's up there would take you out of that experience. Yeah. Like you kind of, I don't know, it doesn't, it's not real, is it? No. And yeah, it's, well, and it's just like, well, you paid a ticket to watch live music. And 
And to me, the fact that something that's pre-recorded, someone's pressing mm. play, is coming out of the speakers. It's like, well, that's you know, that's that's not live music. No. Live music is human beings interacting with each other, playing instruments and and singing or whatever they do mm. together in you know in time as best as possible, and and having fun with it. And yeah, there they are going to be imperfections. And but that's what that's what makes that performance unique. Mm. It, like the, and if you see something cool happen or something weird happen, and you happen to be at that gig, I'm like, oh, that's cool. No one else will see that tomorrow on the next gig, or whatever. Um, you know, things. Mm. In, 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 I guess the style of music I play, it's it's just the way it it always has been. I know things change, and people might say, oh modern you've got to be, be more modern up but i'm like well it's rock and roll <laughs> rock and roll like it's meant to be a feeling and mm. a vibe and it's created with energy from people playing and singing and and this my men shouldn't be a part of it at mm. all like yeah like you said if someone's if there's a band playing and their hit single has got some orchestration you can't, yes, you might be able to play some of it on a keyboard or a synth or something. I don't know. Hmm. And you could hire in a musician to do that. It might be worth doing to some for some bands. But, you you know, it's not going to sound as good. I get that. I, I I give you a pass for that. But when it's, when it's rhythm guitars on backing tracks and hmm. oh, there's nothing worse when I, when I hear that. And it's just like... <laughs> And back and back in vocals and lead vocals, it does happen more than some people think. Mm. Some people think, "Oh, that guy's a great singer." It's like, well, yeah, he's my man. He's mm. not actually singing. Or he, 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 you know, he's, his mic isn't on. He just they just turn it on in between songs, and some people don't realize they just they just assume it's live and that he's a brilliant singer or she. Sorry, rant over. No, no, yeah, I agree. I think I think like rock music's full of these interesting anomalies rock and metal like yes. there are certain things you know like the these imperfections these kind of things that aren't i, I don't think rock's supposed to be perfect i mean as, as we talked about there with ozzy and, and dio i mean dio is a arguably a superior singer ozzy on paper shouldn't be really a good like if you look at him from a critical standpoint he's not yeah. actually a good singer is he no <laughs> but he's it got works a, yeah he's got a very yeah. unique yeah unique voice he's very recognizable which i think mm. if you think, I think of, that's uh, the thing yeah it's just recognizable and i think mm. that that's what if you think of any massive band it's no, they're normally massive because this the lead vocalist has got a very recognizable mm. tone or voice or whatever or style of singing. And if you're somewhere in between, yeah, you might you might make it to a decent level with some good songs or whatever, good albums. Mm. But the, the the massive bands have always got a really distinguished vocal. And it's hard, you know, it's hard, it's hard to do. And, and and as time progresses, it's even harder to do because there's more comparison, more comparables mm. to to go off. I guess when, you know, back in the seventies and all that, you know, there wasn't many other rock and heavy metal bands to compare yourself to. Um, mm. But now there's millions. So to be unique now is harder. Cause yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, there's, I always remember my dad because he was kind of one of the, he went to one of the very early Black Sabbath gigs and he said, he was like, he went there and <laughs> at the time he went, the band are good, but the singer's crap. <laughs> because, because like, there's nothing, there's nothing to really even compare it to. Like, I mean, obviously he really enjoys him now, but it, as he said at the time, it was like, there was just nobody that sounded anything like them. And there was like women that were running out screaming because it was like scary music. <laughs> and like, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Just that so he, different. Yeah. Amazing that he witnessed that. Though. I think that's pretty special. It's bizarre. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's right though. It's and like I like we mentioned earlier, ACDC. Mm. Uh, and obviously they've had two two prominent vocalists. Yeah. But very distinguished voices that you just instantly know it's them, but not on 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 paper, not great singers. No. In any way. But they got the the way they do it, they've got their thing. Um and they, you know, Axel Rose. Mm. Pro- probably was a better singer at one point, but again, very distinguished, uh, recognizable voice in the way he sung. He had a good range back in the day. He could do all the really low notes and mm. sing as high as anyone. He's a you know, no he's he's still trying now, love him. Um <laughs> and to be honest, we he, I think he he sounded better this year than he, he had done you know a few years ago when they were touring. I think uh, I think he's worked on it. Mm. Um but at the end of the day, your vocal changes as you get older and considering his range was incredible back mm. in the day, um I, I think it's just biological and science that it's not possible to to do Even that anymore. A quarter of that yeah, to, is, exactly. Yeah. And um yeah, like like even like Dave Grohl, like mm. technically not the best singer, but you you recognize him immediately, mm. the way the way he sings, and yeah. So all all of these bands I'm mentioning, like some of the biggest bands of, in the world, James Hetfield, instantly recognizable. Mm. You know it's him, mm. um, and it, yeah, it's, it is it's a thing. And I guess once you've found that, um, number one, you want to look after it, but. Yeah, I think that gives you the advantage because if you hear that on the radio, it just goes, oh, that's a bit different to uh, mm. like all the other ge- like generic. It must have got to a point where so many rock bands, like in the 80s maybe, and the, the vocal style became, there was a style of vocal that people were trying to do. And like even I struggle now when I go back to listen listening to certain 80s bands. I'm like, oh, which band was that again? Or which band was that mm. again? Bands I'm not that familiar with because I'm like it's all about the vocalist and 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 the identity of that sound, um, and I, I do struggle to this day. And some of them are big bands, but they they probably not either they're not going anymore or they're not as big as ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's going to take some doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's going to take some doing. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, for those that want to uh, go out and grab grab yourself a copy of the brand new album, uh, Kings of the Asylum, and uh, check out the the, uh, the UK tour that's coming up in uh, November, yeah. um, you can grab your ticket for that and the the uh, the album, whether that be vinyl or CD, via the uh, link in the description below. And uh, thank you very much for for speaking with me. It's been that's cool, right. man. It has been cool. Thanks for having me. And yeah, it's just been nice chilled out chat i enjoyed it very much and um if you want to come to any of the shows drop me mm. a line and uh, be nice to meet you in person uh that would be cool 